So uh, thank you very much for, for coming uh, today. Um, yes, in response to what Neil said, there will be, I think, two pictures of Lego which will appear during the course of this um, this talk. So um, uh, uh, do look out for them. Um, so just a couple of uh, slides about me. I'm going to go quite quickly, uh, by the way, because I think that's probably going to be good. I've got loads of material, but also I'm trying to finish um, after half an hour. So we, we've got a bit of time for chat. So, um, yeah, I'm Professor of Digital Economy at This Thing, which is Initiative for the Digital Economy in Exeter Index. It's a bit of a um, bit of a mouthful. And also, if I tell you we're based in London, uh, but obviously with COVID, we're not based anywhere. That's very confusing uh, for everybody. And then uh, th this is Methods, organization of Brian. I also co-run Methods Analytics with Data Science, um, providing some of the data to uh, Chris Whitty and Co at the moment, and Core Azure, which is the Microsoft kind of cloud organization. Ah, and these are some robots, obviously, and some more robots, which kind of sy sy symbolize a lot of the fear, doubt, uh, loathing, and all the rest of it around this topic about technology and data and privacy and government public services. And uh, and I kind of do quite a bit of writing about this, have done it for some time. So I write some kind of serious things, um, as well as, uh, as, as less serious things and things that sort of um, poke um, government um, when I think they're doing the wrong things and also co-author this book Digitising Government about four or five years ago, God, it was it that long ago, but all of the stuff is um, um, I think actually or sort of the same messaging which is a bit depressing as well in the sense that um, things take a long time to um, to come over really and about two or three years ago did this um, a, at the Institute of Government um, it was a manifest. It's all on the all on Tinternet. Uh, oh, I hopefully if I could see your um if I could see your chat, there's a mention of Lego there in the middle. You probably see that. In fact, there's even the map of Britain is a kind of made in a Lego um a Lego shape, which is kind of exciting too. Um, but I reckon we we could at least transfer 46 billion a year to frontline public services, uh, and I'm going to try and explain why. First of all, let's just have a bit of a. I'm going to draw on my friend Simon Wardley slides, which I often do for those who haven't seen this. Uh, we're just bombarded with all this stuff, right? So digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative. Oh, dearie me, it all sounds so right on, doesn't it? In fact, on the radio yesterday, on Radio 4, there was this thing about how the word disruption was kind of the most overused buzzword and not necessarily a good thing anyway. So we're bombarded with those. And when trying to work out what to do in organisations, you know, you could just almost, there's so much of this stuff, you can just insert it right into a kind of template, digital strategies, blah, we need a blah for the market for use of blah and blah. And of course, you can then auto generate them. And that's exactly what Simon Wardley did. So, uh, <laughs> and I also kind of joke, you know, we're going to go, let's go, I thought we'd go through all 64 this morning. Strategy is customer focused and disruptive effort of the market for use of innovative social media and big data to build a, God, sounds brilliant, doesn't it? Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. Number two, did say we go through 64. You can log off now if you like. Innovative digital business, a growth effort of the market through our use of, uh, and it's all absolute rubbish, of course. It's utterly, utterly meaningless. Um, uh, and actually, this is a website um, that uh, you just keep clicking on it and it auto generates uh, digital strategies for you based on words like disruption. Um, so, so massively overused, a lot of fear, loathing, and doubt. Uh, but meanwhile, we're all increasingly knackered, actually. We'll get to COVID in a minute, but but um, you know we're caught in a, 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 a uh, there, there's there's well there's obviously unprecedented national debt now. Um, we have declining national productivity uh, because as we've been increasingly reminding ourselves over the summer, we no longer exploit an empire. We have no real God-given uh, right to expect better public services than anybody else. We are living longer. We have increased expectations during that expanded uh, uh, lifespan to consume stuff. Um, and we're trying to run all of that stuff out of a 20th century, not a 21st century, but a 21st century way of organising things before the the the, the revolutionary uh, arrival of the Internet. And I'm not the Internet of the late 1990s. I'm talking about the modern cloud based Internet now. And we'll come to that later, which I just think of as being like plumbing that connects all these old silos, these old 20th century silos. And I'm going to come back to this and shoot this up right at the end. But this is my kind of proposition, if you like. This is a spoon bill called localism in the digital economy which i put up at the uh, beginning of the year and it got quite a few people in government scrambling around like like ants because uh, it looked quite convincing uh, and i got these calls from desperate people going mark i've had a team for on this looking for this for all morning can you and of course they hadn't looked down to the bottom of the page where it says spoof parliament copyright bill point is is 
of course, um, when we're lo looking at public services, this notion of localism, yeah, devolution and localism is used as a kind of fig leaf to allow everybody to just carry on reinventing the wheel again and again and again. And people genuinely confuse focusing on, on local people, local stuff for local people, kind of Royston Vasey style, with, um, with centralization. And the answer is, in the emerging digital economy, we need both. And, and the point spot in this bill that I really, really wish we would have, um, uh, kind of say, look, in the last century, it was okay to waste public money or spend public money, it's a good use of public money, to reinvent the wheel again and again and again, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of times, 430 councils, each surrounded by health, social care, blue light, third sector and housing again and again, and all the consultants and outsourcers and all the rest of it, massive industry. Of course, most of this is a back office because it's all making receiving payments and case management and workflow and checking your identity and, and registering for things and licensing things again and again and again and again. And of course, none of these things have anything to do with doctors, teachers, nurses, social workers, daycare centres, uh, libraries, roads, all the rest of it, all the stuff we actually care about. There has been a massive managerialist ballooning uh, run off the 20th, back of 20th century broken, old-fashioned organising, and we have to start doing things differently. And I'm not going to read those things. Hopefully, you've been uh, casting your eyes over them as I've been going along. And meanwhile, while we dither and go, oh, well, what should we do? And interestingly, I've sat in front of, uh, in the last kind of three weeks, I've sat in Labour's digital reviews, kind of small sessions there. And I sat with Julia Lopez, MP, who's the new cabinet office, cabinet secretary. Uh, again, she's only two or three months into the into the, the job, getting her kind of head together about what we do. Um, and we're having another review and thinking about what we should be doing. And meanwhile, of course, all the social costs of this are just mushrooming, mushrooming, mushrooming. And and I really think those of us who who kind of get this stuff, those of us who get it, it is our increasingly abandoned duty to apply digital know-how rather necessarily to helping bankers make more money. Uh, frankly, I find it more personally satisfying to sort this, to, to apply it to this problem of our disintegrating public services. And as public services disintegrate, of course, the legitimacy of our social democratic institutions starts to disintegrate as well, along with the BBC and the judiciary and all sorts of other attacks of populism, if you like, on, on some of the kind of Western democratic institutions, which frankly, I think, in my personal opinion, are partly what's responsible for sustaining our, our good quality of life, quality of life, not rather necessarily than, than lifestyle. So, so I think this old, and I keep this thing, um, because uh, it still reminds me that this notion of, of, do you want, which do you want, more spending or more cuts? It, it's a false opposition, actually. I don't think it's a true opposition. There is a third way, which is to move away from blockbuster government. Uh, you know, you wouldn't anymore drive down to kind of rent a, a video or a DVD from Blockbuster. Um, you'd obviously go to go to Netflix. Um, so so we really are putting up with Blockbuster public services and, and, and we shouldn't have to do it. So I guess, you know, we've got to do something. So radical notions, I think, are absolutely appropriate. Um, I don't buy any, any more, I'm afraid, to this notion that there's no such thing as a revolution. We want evolution. We haven't got time for that, right? So all of those things I've been just talking about that are up there on that slide um, are now being turbocharged as well. Oh my goodness, because the last 10 years we were thinking, aren't we clever? We're, we're, we, we talk about user needs in the digital community and the importance of agile and, and all that's, that's marvellous, isn't it? But also now what's happening in the next 10 years is going to be about cloud, cloud-based utilities and services. So all of the kind of really exciting technology that we want to use, all the MI, uh, sorry, the, the machine learning, the AI, the, the natural language processing, the analytics, the, the IoT, it's all in the cloud and all increasingly it's run by big tech. So we need to think about this. And of course, we started to see uh, in, in the States, them actually started to kind of uh, uh, grow a pair, if you like, and take on big tech. We've seen that recently. This, uh, this thing on the right here was taken yesterday, a screenshot. Um, so we're starting to see some of that, but in the but but there's a whole lot of things are coming together now. So obviously we've got this massive economic impact of COVID. All the stuff I've been talking about was before COVID and before the Brexit word as well, which I'm not going to get into because you all log off immediately. Um, but how on earth are we going to come through it? I think what we've learned from COVID is the essential nature of public digital infrastructure. So not just public infrastructure like roads and and uh, and kind of TV networks and 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 the national grid, but increasingly digital digital infrastructure. But the problem is it's not public, is it? Most of it is actually not public. And Amazon describes itself, for example, as an infrastructure company. Um, and I'm going to come in a minute to this notion of data and health data and, and whose is that stuff? Uh, and I'm very, very worried that it's going to be captured and moved out of the public domain. 
uh, whilst we're all smooth snoozing basically on the job. So I think there are some really very, very important questions about public digital infrastructure, how we use it, the role of government, the role of citizens, activists as well, and indeed what on earth government should be doing in the first place. I'm very influenced by this chap, Tim O'Reilly. He's the guy that coined the term Web 2.0. And in 2005, he coined the term government as a platform, basically saying that you, government needs to start thinking about the smarts of some of these big platform organisations that have revolution our lives to start to look at platform organising of public services. Those of you who are interested in the kind of state of the art thinking, I recommend this that came out not long ago. Um, obviously, it quotes me, so I would recommend it. But actually, it's, uh, David Eads is probably the foremost academic on digital public services I can think of, Harvard. Um, and, and he came up with a really nice, uh, well, Richard Pope did actually, ex-GDS, but quoted in here, a really nice modern definition of government as a platform, because I've written a lot about this, but this is the best one I've seen, I think. So GAP, governments and platforms, should reorganise government around a network of shared APIs, application program interfaces, connectors for software, and components, open standards, and canonical, i.e. trustable, data sets. So civil servants, businesses, and everybody can come together and use this common infrastructure. Now, according to that notion of government as a platform, government, to quote somebody else, should be steering the boat and not rowing the boat. And that takes you straight into the world of politics, of course, and about the role of government. Is the role of government to compete with the private sector, set up uh, and 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 you know set up its own uh, software development uh, organisations, its own its own banking organisations, its own rival organisations, or is it to leverage increasingly the digitised and um, the global digital economy and to and to collectively be the orchestra, if you like, or sorry, the, conduct the orchestra uh, to row the boat, to steer the boat rather than row, row it. So all that stuff floating around, what do we got to do to fix it? Do we just get building stuff? In the last 10 years, there's been a lot of building. And many of you are probably watching this are familiar with the kind of sort of post-its and pictures from government digital service, user needs, bunting, cake, lots of beards, t-shirts, and sometimes a little bit of overly self-congratulatory behavior, in my opinion. But that's just my opinion. I think they got some things right, a lot of things right, in fact, but some things weren't so right. So this are uh, this mantra of user needs only goes so far it has a sort of moral thing i can i can relax if i talk about user needs because i'm obviously serving other people well yes and no sometimes you're just serving yourself in a sense and you know whether henry ford did or did not say if i'd asked my customers what they wanted they'd have said a faster horse the notion is that joe public doesn't always know everything that is right for them in the aggregate in the collective because if you'd ask we can't build a service for each citizen from the ground up. We have to start balancing uh, configuration around citizens and users with platform-based behaviour uh, that does things in a quite a collectively intelligent way. So on the basis of that, I'm going to rip through three things, some three of the most important mindsets that I believe should guide uh, radical public service digital redesign over the coming decade. And their data, their accessibility, and their leverage, this notion of steering the boat, not rowing it. And I'm going to blast through those now. So we've got to take the data enormously, enormously seriously. So this is the fourth industrial re revolution technologies, the modern, the emerging tech I was talking about earlier, the ones on the left, the game changers. And if you're a chief executive of any business or any, frankly, in my opinion, government department or agency, you should be spinning in your bed awake at night, worried sick about what all those things on the left are going to do to your traditional complacent business model and ways of doing things. And public services are at the bottom there. And if we had lots of time for an MBA class or something, we'd take a t bit of time and we'd just talk through each one of those industries or I'd challenge you, in fact, to think of a single industry, undertaking, being an artist, it doesn't matter, which isn't being completely turned on its head by some of these technologies on the left. And of course, all these technologies I've said pretty much live in the cloud. Uh, uh, and they're, they're, they're internet based, they live in the cloud, and we can't build them ourselves. We've got to think about consuming them. And they're all the lifeblood of all of those technologies is, of course, data. Right. Uh, so I was at university back in 1986, seven, um, uh, back when for for 300, sorry, three hundred three hundred three hundred ninety eight dollars, you could get a whole 10 megabytes of data. That was that uh, that was pretty fancy. I remember when I tapped eyes on the first Apple Mac kind of white screen Apple Mac when I was at uni, just 
blew my mind. Now, of course, if you're a good enough customer, the Amazon snowmobile will rock up outside your, uh, probably not your house, but probably your large corporate office block, and you can use petrol pump to kind of pour the data in the back. Um, uh, and why is this happening so quickly? Because, of course, uh, many of you will be aware we've got this thing called Moore's Law at the bottom, where basically the amount of data you can cram on a microchip doubles every year and a half. A year and a half. It's absolutely extraordinary, which is giving rise to some extraordinary disruptive, and I'm using the disruptive word kind of advisedly now, I believe, uh, radical ways of, of doing things. So uh, this this is a, a, an LSE colleague of mine who uh, listened to one of his lectures. A uh, couple of guys in New York, a couple of bozos who make money out of financial arbitrage. So knowing uh, how people are trading a little bit more might be a, a, a minute, might be a few seconds before the rest of the world. Uh, and that's their business model. That's what that's how they make a living. Uh, and they were kind of skirting around for new ideas. And somebody noticed that, of course, satellite imagery up there um, in, in the cloud is uh, very expensive. If you're hovering over the White House or the Kremlin or, I don't know, um, Boris Johnson's um, uh, free homes. And then, of course, uh, some points, uh, some points around the ocean are completely free because nobody's interested in this data. Uh, well, they were interested in this data because they could see basically that container ships going maybe from China to the US, uh, when they were fully laden, okay, their, their wake, the, the trail they left in the water was longer lasting and wider and deeper than when the, when the boat was, uh, was lighter. So they could actually predict, they could see real time trading levels regardless of what they're being told earlier than everybody else, and they made a ton of money out of it, just right there. So data capitalists. And my question is, how can we be social data entrepreneurs uh, rather necessarily than data capitalists? Exactly the same sort of thinking to public services. Another example, there's huge power of data. So this is a screenshot from Google from about 20 years ago. Google's being a cheap advertising company. You obviously see that the yellow box there were the areas at the time where Google got click-through revenue if they could persuade you to click on their ads. And they were trying to work out whether they had the right color yellow um, to, uh, to to encourage people to click on the ads. I don't know whether this story is true or not, by the way, but it doesn't matter, as you'll see in a second. It's possible. So they instructed their engineers uh, uh, to cycle through uh, every possible Pantone shade of the color yellow over a 24 hour period so that each of us logging in would have seen a slightly different color yellow. And after 24 hours, of course, they had um, I don't know, tens of millions, maybe tens of millions of data points, an enormous bell curve that showed, of course, that the color yellow that, that, that you see on the screen was over here at about 10 o'clock. And the real one that was everyone was clicking on was right up at, uh, at, um, uh, at 12 o'clock. So they just shifted the color and uh, generated themselves a few million dollars of av advertising revenue pretty much literally overnight. And that is the power, of course, of statistically reliable bell curve data, which is why, of course, we've got to stop just thinking about technology, 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 probably services and actually thinking about government and being the steward of public data. Uh, and so I've written some stuff saying really that the, uh, the job of NHS X and I had an interesting session with Matt Hancock and even Dido Harding in January before they got distracted by other things. Uh, and they, they were starting to kind of bite on some of these ideas. Um, this notion that really uh, the, the NHS, uh, with the health data economy coming at us like a freight train, uh, it's a wellness and, and using that bell curve of data to, to uh, you know, to add five, six, Six, seven years of, of 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 good life to each of our expectations um, is is actually going to be just as important as sweeping up the mess when people get sick. The issue is is that immensely valuable, it, um, you know, off the off the chart invaluable data going to be in the public domain or is it going to be in the private uh, domain? You can see that being slipped out in the good data, very bad news, an exciting tie up with Google or whoever it is, um, and we'll know we've lost. So. In my view, the state should be acting as a, as a public data entrepreneur, licensing that stuff out for the benefit of ourselves to uh, big tech and, th and third sector and private sector and whoever else. Uh, so there are some kind of real business model business model thinking as well as just what technology do we need. And of course, data is getting much more political. There's some really, really interesting websites starting to come up about this. Some people want the all big data abolished. Uh, there's there's obviously a massive focus, quite rightly, on bias and all sorts of horror stories about uh, policing and, and bias uh, and all sorts of all sorts of. It's, so I think data is becoming a, an important part of civil society and, and, and a kind of a vehicle for protest. And it's incredible how blind people can be. Uh, again, from my LSE friends uh, lecture, uh, an example of this. So, so hidden bias. So uh, 
Spitfires coming back over the uh, over the English Channel um, in the Battle of Britain, and many of them, of course, were getting shot down. This is an actual actual picture from the actual time, uh, what 1941 too. Somebody correct me. Um, and they were trying to figure out how best to armor plate Spitfires, so where to put the armor plating so we, we don't lose as many Spitfires. So of course, uh, this is a, an agglomeration of where all the bullet holes were and the ones that came back, and obviously the high command was saying, well, it's obvious, isn't it? We've got to put the uh, you could got to see where we've got to put these uh, the armor plating. It's on the wingtips in the middle, and it's on the it's of the wing ends. And there was one person there who looked at exactly the same data as you and I are currently looking at, who went, uh, excuse me, I think it's the total opposite, which takes guts, doesn't it, to challenge entrenched data bias. So actually, you're only looking at the planes here, of course, that came back. And as a result of that, they put the armor obviously around the cockpit and and, and the uh, and the propellers and and that thin bit uh, where the where the fuselage uh, taps the wings wings at the end uh, and did something about that. So that's number one. So data massively massively serious at the centre of business and operational models of the future state. Number two, though, back to the back to the uh, steering, not rowing stuff. Accessibility. Now, I'm not just talking in the sense of accessibility that we're all used to hearing about. I'm talking bingo at a particular artificial, uh, so artificial, an architectural um, sense of what accessibility is all about. And and I kind of always narrate this by my favourite, which is a it's a blog. This chap Steve Yeg, who is an ex. Amazon guy who joined Google and he looks like a sort of a coder doesn't he? he's been woken up in the middle of the night uh, having eaten too many pizzas or whatever um, and he's been kind of doing his doing his computer games uh, and he he kind of he's in love with Jeff Bezos he admires the guy but he also hates him so he's dealing with this whole love hate deal thing uh, online and he basically says that I hate Bezos he's he's a I mean, you can see it here it just makes ordinary control freaks like stoned hippies don't like him um, but he said look from now on he did this he said this thing that was just the most important Important thing in the software world, according to uh, Yeg, his big mandate said everyone will expose their data and functionality through service interfaces, APIs, right? You've got to communicate with each other through these interfaces. You can't communicate any other way. You can't build all your own software, no back ends, no, no custom code. And therefore, it doesn't matter what tech you use, it'll all bolt together, basically. Anyone who doesn't do this will be fired. Have a nice day. Ha ha, you 150 odd ex Amazon folks will realize immediately that was a joke because Bezos most definitely does not give a shit about your day. So he kind of loves him and hates him. Uh, and he says that this is the most important thing in the computing world, designing for accessibility. Why is that important? Well, just take, for example, uh, an idea about the Hollywood studio and what that's become. So if we look at 1930s Hollywood studios, um, they were vertically integrated, right? So the studio owner owned everybody from literally the, you know, the, 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 the orchestra to the script writer, to the actors, to the, to the movie theaters, to the studios, to the, they all owned everything. Now, of course, uh, if you look at those, those roles at the top of this slide, content creators, publishing tools, content management, et cetera, they all specialize. OK, they're like Lego bricks. They are very, very accessible. They are designed to plug into other parts of the value chain. They have to do that or else they go bust. There's hardly anyone now there who does everything themselves. And that should include government because, of course, it's in the Internet era. It's not an efficient way to run things. So how do you do that? Well, my mantra, my own mantra uh, is don't just focus, right? Focus on the kind of things that you, that you want to get done, but also Think about how you're going to do those things by leveraging, by consuming and turbocharging what you're doing using the cloud, cloud-based utilities and services. And anyone wants to read more about that, here's a computer weekly piece I did calling introducing, uh, called Introducing Focus and Leverage, a value algorithm of the internet era, saying if you're in a dragon's den situation, you don't want to burn through your pile of cash reinventing the wheel, like building your building your data center or more more. Uh, more currently, maybe trying to build your your um, your AI capability or something. Forget it, right? You just want to latch on to all of those kind of utilities at the moment. Early example of this, if you bought this Jaguar about eight, nine, no, about uh, 15, 16 years ago, you might have been disappointed uh, because, as one journalist found out, uh, when you get inside it, and actually a lot of the switch gear inside your Jaguar was the same as a Ford Focus. And that's why, that's because when Jaguar was taken over by, by, by Ford, or was it General Motors? Did they own Ford? Ah, I'm getting rusty. Um, they basically said, right, you know what? We were going to focus on the things that people really care about. So, so big engine, uh, lots of sort of middle-aged males like me, like driving Jags. We want our kind of leather seats and a sort of gentleman's club feel and a big roaring engine. But actually, we don't care, apparently, about some of these switches here. So we'll just use those bits um, uh, from a Ford. 
and somebody noticed that. But actually, I think they were doing the thing about right. When people start to notice, then you then you put that into your focus. You don't leverage that stuff. When was the last time when you bought a car, when you asked loads of questions about who was it who made the little wire that connects your speedometer to your engine? You don't care, providing it meets certain service levels and doesn't go doesn't go wrong do you so the state should be the same the problem is the state is organized like this drawing these images from mark foden's work of genius video um uh, it's it's getting on now but it's exactly the right thinking we're in silos we don't connect we do reinvent the wheel we're vertically integrated like those 30s hollywood studios and we've got to move to this so he talks about the stuff on the top leaves and dials that's the websites and the and the and the mobile and the and the call centers and how we interact with the state the machinery at the bottom that's your cloud if if you like and your your infrastructure but the hard bit is the bit in the middle and he calls it gubbins deliberately a slang term it doesn't matter what you call it the problem is is separating out what is your kind of focus where's the valuable place to spend public money versus those areas that you need to be sharing uh, a quick example of, of of very very well designed business in my opinion that does that transfer wise right so beautiful example of digital user centric design you can see you can see if i put in a thousand pounds here the recipient gets 1139.89 euros um it's almost lossless because they have accounts in every country um but it's beautiful it's very very um uh user centric it's intuitive to use it's wonderful digital design that's their focus that's how they're going to compete okay they weren't stupid enough to build the back end themselves so they've white labeled the, these guys currency cloud direct into that and if you read that Currency Cloud Direct is a white label platforms, payments platform built using APIs to give you a complete out the box payment solution, which is, of course, what a load of councils were doing when COVID hit. Councils have been vigorously resisting the notion of online payments, of course, for decades. We can't have that. We're a council. Of course, moved to them in two or three weeks time, uh, two or three weeks, literally. Uh, so they didn't build their own. They just kind of hooked to it, allowed citizens to hook to things like Apple Pay and stuff, right? And as we know, some of those arguments are still raging about track and trace. Uh, should we have actually adopted the Apple and Google standards or gone it, gone it our own way and, and built our own? And those arguments are still raging now. Which means if you're Western Union, the idea of, of TransferWise and Currency Cloud hooking up like that, if you are if you are running a legacy 20th century vertically integrated uh, legacy organization like Western Union, you ought to be worried sick because you're probably going to go bust. And if you look just a quick glance around the tube, all of these kind of new funky businesses spring up all over the place. They all adopt what I would call that principle of focus and leverage. In other words, they don't they're all based on cloud based uh, services uh, and they configure those a bit like Lego into very tightly around the user. And this is how we did it. Uh, and so we were caught out uh, on our company methods. Basically, people didn't like uploading and interacting with our horrible expenses claim system. And I'm, I would imagine some of you are groaning and thinking, oh, yeah, I know what that's like. It's really hideous and non-user friendly. So our resident genius, Jilla, uh, building bingo Lego, uh, uh, kind of Lego approach, basically built something called Mexbot, so methods expense bot, one Sunday evening for zero pounds, no money at all, and a few hours, and he banged together, um, obviously, as you can see here, some optical character recognition, some natural language processing, some machine learning to kind of work out what the expenses might be, um, some web services to bang it into our back end of our Salesforce um, system, uh, which meant that suddenly people, all of our people in the organization could take a photograph of their receipt and bang, went straight up into our general ledger. And our own uh, CFO had to shut down or pause our general ledger on Monday at 12 o'clock because we hadn't got the governance ready for that. Uh, so we were caught out and we know about this kind of stuff. Uh, but obviously the parallel, the obvious parallel to public services, which are massively process heavy, is of course, this stuff can rip through a lot of that very, very quickly. We are actually for a Digital Leaders Award for the um, AI Innovation of the Year. The only public sector uh, example of this um, uh, being judged, I think, later on this month. And this is uh, Swindon, um, and that's doing exactly the same thing, basically bolting cheap cameras to Swindon bin lorries, uh, bolting some of those components I just talked about, so that basically as they're going along, it actually starts to build roster lists for different types of waste. So mattresses are different and very expensive to collect than hospital waste to to um, to rubble to whatever. And this stuff actually builds these maps all of the time using the cloud and then actually constructs orders for specific collections of specific different types of waste. Very, very clever. I just love these pictures. I'm sorry. Just 
Oh, go off into a bit of a, a bit of a daze, really. So, so just some early signs to start to wrap up of how um, we're starting to do things better, in my opinion. So, um, obviously, uh, uh, may recognise this: the local digital declaration, government digital service. Um, some of my thinking was behind this because Rishi Sunak um, pinched a few sections of my book um, uh, and uh, talked about it, but didn't give me a, an attribution. Naughty boy. Um, uh, and this is obviously a platform to say we're all going to start consciously sharing stuff and reusing stuff whenever we can. Did a, we did a similar thing for Scottish government a while ago that wanted to know how many times they duplicate licensing and registration across Scottish public services. And we kind of realised that actually, however you license and you, you apply for a license and register for things, it goes through the same things, the same shared service patterns. You have to discover, do I need a license? Where do I get it from? Am I eligible? Okay going to give me one and finally can I have my license and of course those things are underpinned by all of these lego brick like kind of components okay but we're building them again and again paying for them again and again they don't join up we're just reinventing the wheel so it becomes an industry and then having looked at those components the ones on the left this list here you can start to then kind of maybe work across and I'm not naive this this is a transformation that could take 20 years 30 years but it's still the right transformation in my opinion um, so to start to think about our service architecture and all of that kind of leverage stuff that we can start to collectively share they're, they're similar this is a similar set of um, uh, bricks if you like uh, underpinning local public services as well and Scottish I wrote a piece in government in Beijing quarterly and Scottish government is definitely moving I think in the right direction you can see how they're saying the internet for us is an opportunity to start to actually share those things in the bullet points these these kind of common capabilities and therefore our role in Scottish government is to say what things do public sector organizations have in common and can we start to share these things um, and uh, had some involvement in this I think this one was this government transformation strategy 2017 but again there's a section there about developing new common components and and shared capabilities as well and uh, my own uh, an example of the power of this kind of thinking uh, my own uh, local council Tewkesbury's got hardly any money at all it's very very small and they were quoted a hundred thousand pounds for a new website uh, and my local uh, my local member in charge of technology we went down the pub and we actually did some some Wardley mapping uh, for those of you interested in that um, around the notion of how much should we be paying for this website is it a complicated one do we need to have lots of build in it or can we really start to consume and as a result of that really quite harsh question asking session uh, we now pay 150 years uh, 150 quid a year for our website which is pretty radical down from 100 grand so to, to wrap up it's all about the culture it's the thinking this stuff through it's not about the tech it's about politics it's about our willingness to to actually step outside the kind of comforting rather complacent silos that we've been working in all of us for for a long time and when we started shouting transform because that's a good thing generally to shout these days actually maybe start to think about transforming to what what is the role of the state what is the role of public services and in my view it's about having progressive public services but shift the kind of traditional progressive thinking away Away from uh, the answer is to build as huge a state, a traditional huge state as we possibly can out of the 1970s and start to think about what a progressive digitally entrepreneurial state could look like a little bit around this bill that I said I'd kind of come back to. So I think our future depends on the right vision culture i've talked about the architecture and i've talked about the willingness i think to engage in those politics and for me those three kind of pillars are about the data it's about the accessibility and the architecture and it's about the mode of our the government's interaction with the private sector um, in the future as well in a way that kind of makes the market that we all want to have there we go uh, it was a bit of a blast i actually have forgotten to breathe over the last um, uh, few minutes. So I'm going to breathe now and have a look and come back and see if we've got any questions. Well, Mark, that was, um, we covered quite a lot of ground there. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been following the, the chat and we have no questions. So <laughs> <I'm> just suggest, <laughs> I'm not sure it's possible to think hey, of that's cool. <laughs> So in the time we've got left, I'm going to invite people to unmute themselves and ask questions if they want to. I've got one comment of wow, which yes, yes, I would agree. So, so Mark, Mark, it's Martin Cookson here from King Consultants. Uh, great, I love it. Um, I love it when people don't breathe. You get real energy there. Uh, I'll turn my light on. Um, 
the, the idea of platform might be radical for public, but it's not radical for digital community. Um, we all do platforms. Platforms have been around and the idea of building blocks have moved from Corba to, to serverless today. It's still not easy and for digital. And if it was if it was that easy, then there'll be a thousand Amazons, not just one. Um, I'm just worried that um, just saying build it with build a platform is the answer is not is not the answer. People who build platforms actually say, why do you want to build a platform? And we spend a lot more time doing the why than just building the platform. So just maybe it's a it's a it's a shift. You're moving people a long way to get to platforms, but there's still a long way to go even accepted platforms. So I just want to address and make sure that we're not just building loads of platforms. Um, remember the thing in Build It and They Will Come, um, the, the, the film, you know, we all sort of refer back to that as the worry that you build lots of platforms. But yeah, no thanks, Boss. Great question. Um, and I agree with you. Um, and actually, I think this is coming, this is rising up the agenda as to what government, so those of us who believe in the notion of government as a platform, uh, there's a question of how much you should build and how much you should not build. <clears throat> the the I, I deliberately shared the kind of the Richard Pope definition um, earlier in the the deck, which I like because that's more instead of an emphasis on building stuff, it's an emphasis on uh, government's role in standards and APIs and architecture and governance um, and trust building um, and um, and and gradually, if you like, accreting or converging um, a, 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 a public sector organisations to to kind of design and architect their requirements according to those kind of standard templates. Um, uh, and you're right, uh, goodness knows, I think the best writer on this I know is actually um, a co-author of mine, Jerry Fishenden, who writes again and again and again on his kind of why, why, you know, Groundhog Day, Do we, are we, we've been talking about all this for years and years and nobody gets anywhere. Um, and of course, we could have a whole hour conversation about why, why nobody gets anywhere. I do believe that um, that while, during the last 30, 40 years, while we've been having all these discussions, technology has moved on. I do believe that the possibilities and this kind of API revolution does enable a little bit more to happen now in theory than, than would have been the case mm -hmm. there. But you're right. I mean, software architecture has been bedeviled by the notion of, of componentization um, and federal architecture and all the rest of it for, for years and years. So I guess I'm interested in the to not about building the next generation of government legacy. I think it's about a what, what, in my opinion, GDS always should have been, which was an architectural and procurement and trust building nerve centre around open standards, which is actually around the way in which those of us who were involved at the beginning of some of that thinking wanted it to be. It then sort of, in my opinion, drifted off course and started to sort of uh, be all about building stuff to meet user needs. And I think that was a mistake. I think it was a sort of blowing, slightly blowing off course. But I, I agree with you. And many of those questions have still to be asked and I guess what I'm interested in doing is upping the agenda and the urgency of, of that conversation. Right okay yeah. I, I have a question. Um, I'm really interested to, to think about not only government sharing architecture but also the data sets that um, in a recent study I've been doing I've been looking at um, geospatial data sets on how to improve accessibility to to um, satellite imagery and, and specifically so it, it took me I, I did interview some people from the public sector um, different different um, different public sector bodies and it, it appears that they procure data sets independently and I think that's very fascinating because it's very expensive and and um, they don't necessarily share data between them and they don't they, they certainly don't share uh, data that's expensive to access um, out to the public um, and, and I'm really interested to think about what would have to change what would have to be in place for that so to my change? dog is moaning two seconds just let the dog out so i can i can answer that question i think Go on, there you go i did say to neil that might happen she um she very kindly held on for the uh, for the talk she obviously enjoyed the lego pictures um so so we've had a similar kind of experience to this on actually as a private sector startup so i mentioned the data science analytics business that we run um they they came the initial focus was health um, you might remember the David Cameron sort of open gov uh, open data uh, government policy. That policy went out, and obviously we had the creation of the ODI and all these exciting things. But the the response that we saw amongst most public agencies was get off the data. You're not having any of our data because you're an evil private sector person, and we are public sector holier than thou. And this is public data, so you can't have it. And we said. 
The whole point of this about data as a platform is you're not do, you're just sitting on the data. You're not. It is releasing no value to the public at the moment. So we'll pay for it. We'll rent the damn data. But you are supposed by law to release that data unless you have a good reason why to us. And actually, in one or two cases, we agreed on the steps of the court and they caved in because they knew they were wrong. Um, so so it's again back to the why is this taking so long? I mean, I'm afraid I do think that there's. I mean, I've written about this as well. I, I have two. I think what this kind of exposes, I'm afraid, and I know this is contentious. I would like to see a reframing of the word public servant. So I think we have public servants who are doctors, teachers, nurses, social workers, the people who serve the public. And we have a vast management class, uh, which kind of has a revolving door inside, in and out of, you know, consultancies such as what I run. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, who, who, who many of whom make money out of not sharing and not doing these things because they're going to get disintermediated by this sort of model. The sort of model I anticipate, of course, uh, you know, it has a lot of this as common infrastructure like electricity um, and 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 actually just releases funds and effort and hopefully public sector pay to the people who, in my opinion, work in care, care homes or whatever, who really should be paid a lot more than the managers. Uh, so so I'm afraid I'm, I'm call me a cynic. I'm 52 and I'm getting more and more cynical by the day, but um, but more and more vocal about it. I think often it's self-interest. But I mean, some people may or may not disagree. So I think there's a sort of there's a public administration or a public management role. And then there's a public servant role. And I think that the two are different. And, and by being able to hide under sort of moral bushel of the public servants, actually, people can do the wrong thing. A bit like hiding under the bushel of localism and doing the wrong thing for the digital era. Language is a problem, isn't it? That's very interesting. So are you saying the language has to change? Yeah, I do. And, and to the question of what, what specifically is it that would be the leverage point? Of and of course, as, as a sociologist, I'm, I'm interested in discourse and the role of language in discourse and how, how that brings around social reality. Um, I could I could drop a thing um, on this uh, chat afterwards, but I did a, a piece in The Guardian a few years ago just saying we we need to kind of learn from Marx. In other words, it, it's kind of a, in a sense, um, it's a kind of a public, the word public servant is a sort of false consciousness that prevents the public from seeing what is going on. And I think there's been a mushroom of managers and associated professions which are just leeching um, billions away from public services, which again, in the last, uh, you know, century was was all well and good, maybe. But in this century, that there, there is the means to organise ourselves collectively differently. And, and that is properly revolutionary, I think. It's exciting. And I'm not a Marxist or anything. I just find the idea a powerful lens to look at kind of, you know, how words um, uh, kind of constrain people's ability to see the possibility for change. So we're, we're running a little over time. Does anyone want to put in the last question before we, uh, we all thank Mark for his, his talk? Well, thanks for turning up, everyone. <laughs> I enjoyed it, even if you only enjoyed the Lego bricks, but I, you know, I had a good time. Bingo. Oh, good time. Brilliant. Well done, Mark. You made my day. Well done. We're going to have a cup of tea now. I think better leave. Can, we, can I just um, ask everyone to, to thank Mark for, um, for a great session, either in the chat or out loud? That'd be great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, Cheers, well thank you, Mark. Thank you. Brilliant, as always. Thanks, really fascinating. Much appreciated. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Right. Thanks all. Thank you. All right. oh, I didn't talk about Heart FM. Too late. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, you've got to probably get the idea by now.